Hello and welcome to another video which is going to get you to the very top grades at GCSE. Today we are focusing just on one idea, it's Jekyll's house and understanding this idea will help you in any essay you get on Jekyll and Hyde. So this video will form part of your answer no matter what the essay is and help you get those grades. Let's find out why. Well here is Leicester Square round about 1910 and you can see that it's different from today it's still a grand place but in 1910 it's starting to turn a little bit more commercial. You still get a sense of how wealthy an area it is and how respectable Dr Jekyll must have been. Now in this image we now have a more modern picture of Leicester Square and what we're looking at on this corner is we're looking at that corner there. Now Jekyll's house unfortunately is here off screen but it still survives in the modern day. This is it. It's now got a pub underneath it but you can see how huge it is and how it represents wealth and a facade of respectability on the outside and that is what Jekyll looks like. Now Stevenson chose this house specifically because he knew that his readers would know it and understand it. Now this house was famous to Victorian readers because it belonged to Dr John Hunter. There used to be several statues like this in Leicester Square which have since been removed. He was a celebrated man but the problem was he was also famous for working illegally on dead bodies. In other words, he paid body snatchers, people who made their living illegally, uh, unburying, if you like, digging up the dead and taking their bodies still fresh to the doctor to be dissected. Now, this is at the heart of Victorians' unease about science because what this led to was a superb understanding of the anatomy and how the body worked and so it led to much better surgery remember he's a surgeon surgeon and it led to much better recoveries from patients but it was all achieved through illegal activities and Stevenson's really interested in that because the legal side is the facade at the front and if you look if you google John Hunter's residence, you'll see that the front is this facade, but as you move towards the back of the house, there's this theatre in which he'd have all his doctor friends and students come and watch him dissect these bodies, which he had illegally stolen. So straight away, this house is a symbol for the dangers of science. It's a symbol for the duality of man. And it's a symbol for Jekyll and Hyde himself. The front of the house is Jekyll and the back where this illegal activity goes on is Hyde. So let's explore a little further how the house is a metaphor for this duality of man and the duality of Jekyll and Hyde. Let's look at the actual description. Round the corner from the by street there was a square of ancient handsome houses that's Leicester Square, as you've seen, now for the most part decayed from their high estate and let in flats and chambers to all sorts and conditions of men, map engravers, architects, shady lawyers and the agents of obscure enterprises. So why do you think Stevenson has included these people? Uh, well, map engravers shape the world. They show us what the world looks like. And that's what Stevenson's trying to do. It's very subtle. He's saying, look, read my book and I'm going to show you a true picture of the world. This is what mankind is really like. Why architects? Well, architects build things, don't they? And Stevenson is trying to build a more critical readership. He wants his readers to understand that the world is not as it seems. And he's trying to show them what it really seems or what it really is like, sorry through the use of buildings of metaphor and that's why he's got this little joke of including architects and then there's this other joke I've included in bold he's pointing out that there are shady lawyers here and this is his way of having a wry joke about Utterson. Utterson himself is a shady lawyer who is corrupt and willing to cover up um, Jekyll's knowledge of Hyde the murderer 
So one house, however, second from the corner, was still occupied entire, and at the door of this, which wore a great air of wealth and comfort, though it was now plunged in darkness. So he wants to make sure we understand that this house that Jekyll owns is a symbol of wealth and comfort, but also look at the metaphor. It wore this, this air. It appeared this way. And so this is like a disguise. It's hiding the truth that's inside. Just like Jekyll's respectability is hiding the truth of Hyde, which is inside him. And then the physical description of it now being plunged in darkness is also a metaphorical description, which suggests how Jekyll has himself become dark in his pursuit of pleasures which society considers to be sinful. Now Stevenson contrasts this with the description of Hyde's house, which is just around the corner in Soho. Now what's really interesting about Hyde's house when we meet it is it doesn't sound like the home of somebody who is full of sin. He doesn't sound like the home of a criminal. It's not disordered. It's not uh, full of evidence of crime. Instead, it's full of evidence of good taste, like a gentleman's. Let's explore. In the whole extent of the house, which but for the old woman remained otherwise empty, Mr Hyde had only used a couple of rooms. But these were furnished with luxury and good taste. A closet was filled with wine, the plate was of silver, the napery elegant, a good picture hung upon the walls, a gift, as Utterson suppose, from Henry Jekyll, who was much of a connoisseur, and the carpets were of many piles and agreeable in colour. So what we have here is Hyde's good taste and his taste for the good things in life of which society approves. Uh, so he has wine. He hasn't drunk it all. His closet is still filled with wine. He's not an alcoholic character. This is quite interesting, isn't it? He doesn't just give in to all his desires, it seems. He has very good silver plates for display and eating on. Again, a symbol of refinery. refinery. He's described as elegant. Now, because this is in brackets, as Utterson supposed, Stevenson is introducing us to the idea that maybe Jekyll didn't give this stuff to Hyde at all. These were Hyde's own purchases. Now, through this description, Stevenson is giving us another possibility that Hyde doesn't just represent another side of Jekyll. He actually represents another side of who we want to be. He's saying that all respectable people, who we might describe with this sort of description, share the same interests and desire as Hyde does. So what he's getting at here is, although it appears that he's creating a monster in Hyde, actually he isn't. He's just describing the world as it really is. Once you take away the elegant facade and look inside, what you find is good taste. What you find is who we want to be. There's a bit of Hyde in all of us. And that's the coded message of this physical description of Hyde's house. We can delve a little deeper into how the house is a symbol of hidden identity. So if we go back to Jekyll's house, the doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon. Well, we just met him, remember? And he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre. Once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. So here again, Stevenson wants to be really explicit. He's saying, look, this surgeon was celebrated, and he still is. But his, his achievements were based on chemical apparatus, the idea of drugs again, um, but also linked to crime, which is why Utterson finds it distasteful. 
At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red bays, again the colour symbolising danger and anger. And through this, Mr Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room, fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval glass, now that's a full-length mirror, and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. A fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf. For even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr Jekyll, looking deadly sick. So here we have a physical description that shows how Jekyll is trying to hide his true self from the world. He's allowed his windows to become dusty. He's barred them up with iron so that the outside world can't come in. The house is even full of fog, which is a description of London, of course, but it is as though, metaphorically, Jekyll has invited this fog in in order to keep himself hid hidden. Now, we end with the idea that he is deadly sick. So this is a physical description of his illness, but it's also a metaphorical description. His sickness here isn't that he has created Hyde, his sickness is that he cannot be Hyde, that he has to keep Hyde secret, that he has to have this facade at the front of the house and hide the real um, humanity inside. Now, one way of reading this is Stevenson saying to his readers, well, is your inner Hyde actually such a terrible beast? Perhaps it's only religion that tells you it is. And perhaps it's only social rules that actually we shouldn't have in the first place. That's one way of reading the book. Another way that most Victorian readers would have read it as was as a warning against going against society. So in the Victorian, in the contemporary Victorian mind, many readers would have thought actually um, the problem isn't that Dr. Jekyll is trying to disguise his inner self. The problem is his actual inner self. He's responsible for his own sinfulness and his own moral decay. Now, if we delve a little further into the novel, we can see that Stevenson desperately wants us to make this connection between the description of the house and the themes of duality and good and evil and the dangers and positive aspects of science. And he does that through his use here of the word housed. In each, I told myself, so this is uh, Jekyll reflecting on the creation of Hyde and how Hyde is both similar and different to himself. So if each, I told myself, could but be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust delivered from the aspirations might go his way and remorse of his more upright twin. So here he's imagining that creating Hyde would allow him to enjoy all the evil that Hyde does while still uh, remaining a respectable figure without guilt, without remorse, as Jekyll, because he could argue that he hasn't actually done anything as Jekyll. It was Hyde that did it. But the word he uses to describe these two beings being in the same body is the word housed. In other words, he's telling his readers, look, my house is important. It is working as a symbol about how we are all split into these two different identities, our respectable Jekyll character and our much less respectable Hyde character. Now, just in case his readers miss that allusion to housed, he does it two more times that I want to show you about. The drug had no discriminating action. It was neither diabolical nor divine, so it wasn't linked to the devil or to God. It but shook the doors of the prison house of my disposition, and like the captives of Philippi, that which stood within ran forth. So he's talking about his body as like a house, or actually not just his body, his disposition. So this is his mind and mood. And what he's saying here is that the drugs are neutral. All they did was unlock the house, and what was naturally in there already came out. In other words, the drug didn't make me evil, didn't make this diabolical figure of Hyde. The drug simply released what's inside all of us. We are all like Jekyll and Hyde. 
And then towards the end of um, Jekyll's story, he says, and now I was the common quarry of mankind, hunted, houseless, a known murderer, thrall to the gallows. So here, Hyde cannot go out. He can't go to his own house, so he's houseless there, and he can't be seen in Jekyll's house because then it looks like he's murdered Jekyll. He has to hide in the cabinet at the back. So actually, we become less when we give in entirely to one part of our personality here, the, um, the lascivious part, if you like, the, the part with vices, which is Hyde. But if we had remained balanced, part Jekyll and part Hyde, then Stephen is suggesting, Stevenson is suggesting we wouldn't be houseless. We would, in fact, be normal. So this is his plea to his Victorian society to say, stop demonising uh, behaviour which you claim is diabolical. Actually, if we just accepted ourselves for who we are, we would lead much better lives. So if we take a step back, we can see that actually Stevenson isn't writing about the horrors of what is inside us in the form of Hyde. He's actually saying that perhaps we shouldn't fear what is inside us. We shouldn't keep hiding it, hence the choice of the name Hyde. Another way to prove that is to look at the description of the drug. You know, the drug that unleashes this great evil, this supposedly diabolical being in Hyde, is actually not diabolical. It had no discriminating action. In other words, he's saying that we don't need to fear um, the effect of these drugs. Opium doesn't make anybody kill anyone. It just puts people in a stupor of dreaming or fantasy or unlocking the mind, as it was believed back in Victorian times. This is nothing to be afraid of. Having sex with people that we find attractive is nothing to be afraid of, and therefore Jekyll ought to be able to have sex with whoever he likes. Now, this society is so against that kind of view that it doesn't even mention the word sex in his book. There is no sexual activity described in it because it is so taboo. But what Stevenson is suggesting is that that is ridiculous. And so the tragedy of this story isn't that um, Hyde is necessarily evil, it's that he is treated as evil and therefore becomes so. And if we return to the original house, we'll see that that is what he means. Uh, John Hunter's house was a marvel because of the discoveries that were made inside. And if you think of our modern society, we now routinely perform autopsies on dead bodies. We don't ask for the permission of the family to do that. We have, of course, criminalised drug taking, which has led to all sorts of other problems in society by creating the powerful criminal gangs who deal in it. And we have made tremendous advances in science, which allows us all to live longer. And this is the very thing that Stevenson is saying should be allowed to continue, and in Victorian times, he felt were being oppressed. And so we can argue that the creation of Jekyll and Hyde shows that the duality of man is inside all of us, but also not an opposition between good and evil. It's simply our human nature, and we should stop labelling it as good and evil and simply see it as part of the same thing, just like Jekyll's house is the same as Hyde's house. They just adjoin onto each other. And by Hyde's house, I don't mean the one in Soho here. I mean the part that he lives in um, at the back of Jekyll's house. So Stevenson is simply arguing that this is the perfect form of architecture, just as human beings are. We should accept each other for how we actually are and not worry about the false front, which gives us social respectability. So more than enough to fit into any essay you have to write about Utterson or Jekyll or Hyde, or indeed the themes of the novel. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and see you soon on my channel.